Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here today with us for our webinar, Generating and Depositing Nanoparticles at the Push of a Button with VSP G1 and VSP Accessories. My name is Andrea Ilinka, and I will co-host today's session together with Martin Kamp and Wilbert Breipur. But before we dive into the actual presentation, I would like us to wait a few minutes so that everyone joins. So please be patient. We will start in a few minutes. Thank you and talk soon. Thank you everyone for waiting and uh, we hope everyone is doing well. Uh, we are ready to start now. Our previous webinar for those who are present uh, presented our technology and complete product portfolio. In this webinar today, our aim is to get you more acquainted with the possibilities and ease of use of our nanoparticle generator and its accessories. We thought the best way to get this across to you was through a combination of a classical webinar presentation and a virtual lab experience, which is something we will do today. Behind our virtual lecture, we have Martin Kamp, and who will, is going to present the ins and the outs of our nanoparticle generator and accessories product life. And in our virtual lab, we have Wilbert Breipur, who, who will take walk you through the assembly and use of VSP G1 and accessories. But before we dive in into the presentation, I would like to take you through the flow of today's webinar. I will walk you a little bit through the webinar interface and discuss how we are going to handle the questions during the webinar discuss webinar recording and also upcoming events. I will then give you information on how to get in touch with us and provide feedback. I will then give a short introduction into BS Particle for those who are not familiar with the company. And the last session of the webinar will be dedicated to answering your questions. We do encourage you to ask questions during the webinar. You can find the chat room in your bottom right corner, the icon with the question mark. So it would be really good if you start uh, uh, putting questions during the webinar so we can take them at the end. For the questions that remain unanswered, don't worry, we will do a follow-up email. Please don't forget that you are on mute in this live session and you won't be able to speak. This webinar session will be recorded and we will send you a link in the coming days so you can share it with your colleagues or watch it later. For our upcoming webinars, we will have three upcoming sessions and we will let you know the dates in the follow-up email. The first one is introducing the VSP P1 nanostructure material printer, the ultimate tool for material development. Then size-dependent particle property screening made simple with the VSP S1 size selector selector and novel supported catalyst development, the VSP PC powder coder, which is the latest addition to our product portfolio. We do have additional information that we're happy to provide. So if you would like to receive a mailing of this or register for future webinars, please get in touch with us after the follow up email. We would like to have feedback from you because this information will help us understand how we can best support your research. If you have questions or webinar topic, topics you would like to suggest, you can always reach us via our communications department. Our contact person is myself, Andrea Ilinka, a.ilinka at vsparticle.com or by phone, international prefix 31063389908. If you know if you want to know more about VS Particle Solutions and how they can help you in speeding up your research, please contact our sales department via Martin Kamp at m.comp at vsparticle.com or by phone international prefix 31088308 uh, Unlocking the full potential of new materials and empowering material pioneers is at the core of VS Particle. Born out of the research labs of TU Delft with over 20 years of experience in the synthesis of aerosols, VS Particle believes there is a whole new world of possibilities at the nanoscale. 
As we all start to understand these possibilities, it will enable research and industry to rethink production processes and develop new materials to create innovative applications. By introducing a fully automated and reproducible production process of new nanostructured materials, we can provide researchers with the right tools to explore unique material properties and easily integrate them into much needed applications. Since 2014, the company has helped scientists and industry leaders to drastically reduce the development time of new advanced materials, advanced materials that are needed in solving some of the biggest challenges of the 21st centuries. Empowering researchers in fields such as catalysis, semiconductors and healthcare is essential if we are to solve some of these challenges. The company currently employs over 20 young passionate people and it's headquartered in Delft and by now has an international distribution network in the USA, Europe and Asia. Here on the screen you can see a map of the installed base of VS Particle R&D systems. Thank you everyone for following me through this introduction. Uh, I will now give the uh, mic to my colleague Martin Kamp and I will talk to you at the end of the presentation when we will take your questions. We hope you enjoy this webinar and I'll, see, I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Martin? Thank you, Andrea, for the kind introduction and welcome everyone to today's webinar session. My name is Maarten Kamp and I'm currently the Commercial Director at VS Particle and I will be co-presenting this session together with my colleague Wilbert Freiburg. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, explain a little bit more about VS Particle and what we do in a nutshell. Uh, we are a key technology provider in catalysis, semicon and health. And our mission is to accelerate the development of new materials and products by enabling automated nanoparticle production. And especially the latter, I would like to talk to, uh, to you a little bit more about today. Um, at VS Particle, we believe that these products uh, that enable the production of nanostructured materials for both fundamental and applied research should all be based on a simple uh, and easy to operate and scalable principle. And here you can see the entire production uh, product portfolio that we currently have, which was already introduced on our previous webinar that can be found on our website. But today I would like to like to talk uh, specifically about the VSP G1 and the VSP A series accessories. So I will walk you through each of these products um, and then I will uh, forward you to my colleague Wilbert, who will be giving you uh, an hands on introduction in the virtual lab that we have for you in place today. I would like to start with the VSP G1 nanoparticle generator, which is the core of all our products and setups. On the left-hand side, uh, you can see the, uh, an, an, a picture of the VSP G1, uh, where you have a gas inlet on the left side, a gas outlet on the right side, and there's a reactor hat in the middle. And on the right, you can see a schematic of what the internals and the process looks like. And something I would like to emphasize here is that the process takes place under atmospheric, atmospheric conditions. So what's going on? Uh, we introduce a carrier, carrier gas from the left-hand side, which is usually an inert gas like argon, argon or nitrogen, uh, but we can also use air. Then there's the target electrodes that consist of the desired material that you want to synthesize your nanoparticles of. And we introduce an electrical discharge between these electrodes, which locally evaporates uh, the, the electrode surface. And these Electrodes are carried away, uh, the atoms are carried away from the plasma by the carrier gas and they start to coalesce and coagulate and later on aggregate downstream. And we can control the right hand side of the process. By controlling the residence time, uh, we determine the particle size that we make. So first of all, we have an atomic vapor, which then uh, starts to grow towards atomic clusters uh, and then into primary particles and at some point this process uh, goes to aggregation and agglomeration of the particles. This allows for different applications because we can apply some tricks from the aerosol fields uh, like inline measurements or we can expose cells or tissue to the aerosol and we can tune the average particle size that we produce. So there's different different applications that we see uh, for example, modeling pollutants for um, uh, emission testing, nanotoxicology, understanding the, the toxic effects of these materials uh, if they are airborne, 
calibration for aerosol equipment like uh, CPCs and SMPS or emission testing for the automotive industry. One of the natures of the process is that there's a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, the use of materials. So here you can see different schematics um, of the setups that we can use. The first one I would like to talk about is when we use the same electrode material and then we also create nanoparticles consisting of material A. But we can also apply different methods. For example, if we com uh, combine electrode A together with electrode B, we can make nanoparticles which consists of alloys of A and B, um, but these will have different compositions. So some will have slightly more A, some will have slightly more B, depending on where um, from the spark gap they reside. If we want to make controlled alloys, we have to use pre-alloyed electrodes, and then we actually get the same composition in the nanoparticles uh, as we get in the electrode material. We can also combine different systems uh, to make more complex layers or morph morphologies. The first one is sequential deposition, where we use uh, the, the first generator to synthesize material A, and then later on deposit material B to be able to generate stacked layers. The next one is the mixing of two different um, um, gas streams. So we have the first generator generating uh, material A, and then these particles are fed through the second generator where material B is deposited on material A. And depending on the, the metal interactions, uh, the material interactions, this can lead to either core shell structures or island formation. And the last thing we can do is we can also mix the gas streams to make mixed layers consisting of different materials. We're able to process any kind of conductive or better conductive uh, material. So here you can see an overview of all the materials that we can use. Um, and like we already mentioned, we can also produce alloys. On this slide, you can see what the electrodes look like. Uh, so they fit in a system with a, a smooth and easy click system, which Wilbert will show you in a bit in more detail. Um, and the last thing I would like to present to you before going to the lab is an application example. Uh, so this is one of our customers in the Netherlands, uh, who's working for the Dutch Healthcare Institute, the RIVM. And Professor Fleming Casse does different kinds of inhalation toxicology studies where he uses the VSB G1 as a, a model nanoparticulate source to expose cells and tissue to the aerosol uh, containing these ultrafine particles to determine what kind of toxi toxicologic effects there are on the tissue. And now I would like to hand on uh, hand off the mic to my colleague Wilbert. Uh, in the well, hello and welcome to the VS Particle Virtual Lab. Uh, my name is Wilbert Schreiber, and I'll try walk you through uh, the assembly of um, our VSP G1 system, um, as well as the uh, assembly of the uh, accessories that come along with it. Now, here on my left, I have the base unit of the VSP G1 nanoparticle generator, and this is really the uh, beating heart of our technology. Um, on my right, I have a disassembled reactor head, and the first step that we need to do is to assemble the reactor head and place it onto the base unit. Now, what you can see here is I have a pair of carbon, oh, sorry, copper electrodes. We use a click system. These electrodes are uh, hollow, and we can just place them directly um, into the electrode holders, and they just click into place very easily. We provide a, uh, an assembly stage. Um, we use this to then assemble uh, the reactor head. So we take one part of the reactor head, we take the through flow piece and an O-ring, slide those onto here, and then we clamp these together using a single clamp. Like so. so that's the first half. Same with the second half. We use the O-ring and the other uh, electrode holder. And then we just clamp this together. Like so. We now have the reactor head um, assembled and lined, and we can place it directly onto the base unit. And since we use an alignment tool, um, it fits on directly. Uh, the next step is to then take these two pins 
Um, these are used to uh, ensure that the reactor head has uh, good contact with the base unit. So, like so. Um, and then typically you would have a, uh, or you will have a, a, a gas inlet, which could be nitrogen or uh, argon. And this side would be connected to the uh, mass flow controller. And then on the outlet side, you would have a tube that would go to either your sample or to, uh, uh, and then to, through to the HEPA filter, which then removes any uh, remaining nanoparticles uh, so that they don't enter into the atmosphere. Um, once you have it set like this, uh, you can turn it on. And the first step that you'll need to take after you switched it on is to align the electrodes. This is done by pressing the button. So what it does now is it moves the electrodes as far apart as possible to uh, get a, a zero position and then it moves them as close uh, as possible to each other until a small spark uh, starts. Um, and then this means that you are ready to start your experiments. In principle, this setup uh, can already be used for uh, nanotoxicology uh, research uh, as well as uh, emissions testing. So now that you've seen the assembly of uh, the G1, uh, I'd like to hand you back to Martin. Well, thank you, Wilbert, uh, for the introduction. Um, I would like to explain a little bit more about the different accessories that we have, which we call the VSPA series. Um, and they use different deposition techniques to be able to generate different samples. And we will go through each one of them. So here you can see the different chambers, which Wilbert will show you in a bit more detail later. Um, but these are all designed uh, in their own way to be able to uh, code surfaces with nanoparticles and create different structures. And I'll explain the different um, methods in a bit. The markets that we see this relating to are catalysis, uh, sensor development, healthcare applications, energy applications, and filter testing. So the first method I would like to cover is the diffusion method, which you can see on the left hand side. And here you can see the VSP A1 diffusion chamber, which is um, attached to the VSP G1 nanoparticle generator. And on the right hand side, you see a schematic of how diffusion works. So basically there's a substrate parallel to the gas stream um, and uh, the particles that bump into the gas molecules, uh, which is called Brownian motion, and then they will deposit at random uh, onto the substrate, which creates these kinds of well dispersed samples. Then we have the characteristics of the setup. So similar to what Robert already showed, uh, there's a gas inlet on the left-hand side. Uh, the VSP A1 diffusion chamber is attached on the right-hand side. There's a sample holder which can load different 2D substrates, and there's a gas outlet to dispose of any kind of remaining gas and particles. The kind of substrates we, that we can use, um, the sample stage um, allows for loading different 10 by 10 millimeter samples or smaller. That's the maximum size that we can handle um, and we can effectively reach surface coverage of 1 to 10 percent. This is mainly designed to uh, deposit on TM grids or in situ TM chips, silicon wafers or coated wafers. And the applications that we see are TEM studies, in situ spectroscopy, electrocatalysis, photocatalysis, and fundamental material research. And I would like to give a few examples um, of people that are using the uh, diffusion chamber. Uh, the first one is a collaboration we did with the TU Vienna in Austria with the group of uh, Professor Gunther Ruprechter. Uh, and on the right hand side, you can see a sample of uh, gold particles deposited on a TEM grid. Uh, with a deposition time of 30 minutes. Uh, and this is a HDF stem uh, image of the particles. And what you can see it is that these are clean surfactant free nanoparticles, which are very small. The second application example that I would like to cover is from the group of Professor Berghuizen at the University of Utrecht. Um, and here we deposited nickel uh, particles also on a TEM grid for six minutes uh, to be able to determine the structure sensitivity of the catalyst. This is a publication that's currently in preparation, um, but the data that you see is uh, uh, the EDS image that was made by Oak Ridge National Labs, where you can clearly see that the particles are consist of only nickel and that there's no carbon surfactant layer. 
And the last application that I would like you like to talk you through is also from the group of Professor Beckerkhuizen, and it was recently published by uh, Mrs. Wondergem et al., which was related to shiners, uh, which is a relative, le relatively new field uh, in uh, cat catalyst development. And here we deposited nickel uh, on uh, gold encapsulated by uh, silica, and the comparison was made by spark ablation prepared samples versus colloidal uh, samples uh, and imp wet impregnation samples and we uh, achieved or it was shown that the spark ablation sample was roman active and this opens up a new possibility uh, of investigating lower transition row metal uh, metals for shiners and i would like to hand off the, uh, the mic again to wilbert and back to the lab well, welcome back to the virtual lab. Um, I'm now standing in front of the uh, uh, A-line accessories. Um, here on my right, I have the A1, which is the diffusion chamber. In front of me, I have the A2, which is the filtration unit. And on my left, I have the A3, which is the impaction unit. Um, to begin with, I'll uh, walk you through the uh, assembly of the diffusion chamber. This is really ideal for substrates such as uh, uh, silicon wafers or TM uh, grids. These are 2D uh, substrates. Uh, we will use um, a sample holder um, and I'll demonstrate how to uh, load a silicon wafer on there. We take off the, uh, the ring, then we place a silicon wafer. These are uh, one by one uh, centimeter. So if I can carefully take one out, there we go. And I gently place this onto the sample stage like so. And I secure it with the uh, ring, like so. We can then place uh, the stage on a uh, the sample holder on a sample stage, and this then slides directly into the uh, diffusion chamber. Let's get this the right way around. This slides directly into the diffusion chamber, um, and we can easily clamp this uh, secure and then we can load it directly onto the uh, outlet of the G1. So if I now bring this to the uh, G1, we have the outlet here. I can connect this directly onto the uh, diffusion chamber in which I have my uh, silicon wafer. Um, and this setup uh, would have your uh, nanoparticle generation here. The nanoparticles will deposit on your silicon wafer here, and then through the outlet, it will go through a filter to remove any remaining nanoparticles. Um, such a setup is ideal for uh, in-situ TM samples uh, as well as uh, shiners samples for low transition metals. So with that, I'd like to hand you back to Matt. Thank you, Robert. Uh, we'll now introduce the second deposition mechanism, which is filtration. Um, so here you can see the VSP A2 filtration units uh, also attached again to the VSP G1. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see a schematic uh, where basically we use a porous medium uh, like a filter, which is perpendicular to the gas stream uh, and then the particles the deposit on the, the fibers of the filter or other porous media. If you look at the characteristics, um, it's attached in a similar way like the previous accessory. So again, it's attached on the right hand side of the G1. We have a gas inlet on the left. Filtration unit is here. Uh, the sample holder is inside this chamber, which can be uh, unscrewed by this ring that you see, uh, which Wilbert will show you in a little bit in more detail. And again, there's a gas outlet to dispose any remaining aerosol. The filtration unit is designed to handle uh, standard 47 diameter filters, uh, but different porous substrates can be loaded. Uh, and also if the, the surface area of the filter that you would like to use is smaller, uh, there's also the opportunity to use different masks. The substrates that are typically used are filter paper, carbon cloth, a metallic mesh or electrospun wires. And the applications that we see are electrocatalysis, photocatalysis, in situ spectroscopy, uh, unsupported nanoparticle production and the ground up production of GATS list. Again, we have two examples. Uh, the first one is deposition on electrospun wires, uh, and in this case, uh, a dendrite 
structure of uh, alumina is grown uh, together with the, the active gold catalyst. And on the right hand side, you can see the respective SEM and TEM images that show the, uh, the zoom in of the structure. And the second application that I would like to show is uh, combined nickel carbon synthesis uh, for the dry reforming of methane. Uh, this is a product project that has been done uh, with Dr. George Biscos, who's affiliated to TU Delft and the Cyprus Institutes, Institute. And in this case, we used two VSP G1s combined with one uh, filtration unit. Uh, and one G1 uh, had nickel electrodes and the other one had carbon electrodes, which allowed us to mix the gas streams and, and uh, combine um, have a, have a well dispersed nickel inside the carbon structure, which was then deposited on the uh, carbon filter. Then the catalytic activity was tested for the dry reforming of methane at 750 degrees and one atmosphere. Um, and here we can see that we actually were able to synthesize uh, an active catalyst for this reaction. Now let's go back to the lab to Wilbert to show this in more detail. Well, welcome back to the lab. Um, is the uh, A2 filtration unit. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'll disassemble it. Um, we have a ring down the middle which secures the entire thing in place. We can take off the top part. Uh, you can see it's also uh, got a second ring on the inside, uh, which brings us to the uh, securing ring. And then, as you can see here, we have a uh, we have a gauze which uh, we place our substrate. On. Now, possible substrates that you can use include uh, uh, just normal filters, uh, carbon felt, um, and also uh, meshes such as titanium mesh. And titanium mesh is uh, of particular interest within the uh, electrocatalysis community. So you can uh, directly deposit nanoparticles that are produced by the G1 um, and deposit them directly on a, uh, on a titanium mesh. Um, even though our filtration uh, goes is circular, uh, we uh, can prepare masks, which can then funnel the nanoparticles directly onto the uh, mesh, uh, which makes it uh, quite convenient to prepare um, uh, nanoparticles ordered on the titanium mesh. I will um, assemble the A2 accessory unit using uh, just normal filter paper. This is where if you want to collect uh, nanoparticles that are all supported. So let's bring this a bit closer. So we can place the uh, fil filter paper directly on there secure it with the plastic ring, secure the plastic ring with the second ring. Um, there are a number of rubber O-rings in here, and this is to ensure that uh, everything is leak tight. If you secure it like so, it's ready to be mounted directly onto the uh, G1, which I'll do now. So here I'm in front of the G1. Um, I've added an attachment to ensure that the opening fits onto the opening of the filtration unit. And we just use it, an O-ring and clamp to ensure that it's uh, fast and security. So there we go. So again, we have a nanoparticle generator and a filtration unit, and we can deposit our nanoparticles directly onto the filtration unit. Um, applications that we see with this um, um, are uh, catalysis, and in particular electrocatalysis, in which you can produce electrodes uh, fairly rapidly. So, back to Martin. So now we go to the last uh, deposition method, which is impaction. And again, the VSP A3 impaction unit uh, is attached in a similar way to the VSP T1. And the method that we use is impaction. So the chamber is under rough vacuum, and rough vacuum means around 0.1 millibars. Uh, and we accelerate the gas through a nozzle and then bombard the substrate with the aerosol. Uh, and because of the, the, the impact energy, these particles start to center on impact, and we can make these nanopores layers. Looking at the characteristics, again, there's a gas inlet on the left-hand side. The VSP A3 impaction unit is attached downstream of the G1. Uh, there is a sample holder, um, which can be um, um, adjusted to different heights uh, compared to the nozzle, in relation to the nozzle. 
Then there's the gas outlet, but this time we also have a connection for the vacuum pump to be able to achieve the rough vacuum that we need for the impaction. It has an adjustable spot size of uh, up to three millimeters uh, and is ideal for making nanoporous layers. And the substrates that we use are typically 2D substrates like silicon wafers or TEM grids. And the applications are mostly sensing applications, uh, either gases uh, or different um, or optical applications. Um, but it's also implemented in our follow-up module, the S1, the size selector, which we'll talk about in, in one of our next webinars. And I would like to hand off the mic again to Wilbert in the lab. So welcome back to the lab for the final accessory, the uh, A3 impaction uh, chamber. Um, this, uh, this accessory is ideal for, uh, again, silicon wafers and TM chips. Um, I'll do my best to uh, try and load uh, a TM grid on uh, the sample holder. Sample holder is again um, uh, uh, a small stage uh, with, that's secured with the ring. Um, since we're using a TM grid, we have a mask uh, to ensure that uh, the TM grid stays in place. So I'll remove that. And then if I calmly place a TM grid directly onto the impaction chamber, like so. There is also a small uh, cutout within the impaction chamber specifically for a TM grid. Now I can secure the TM grid with the mask and secure the mask with the ring. Like so. This can now be uh, loaded directly onto uh, the stage. And then the stage can be placed directly into the impaction chamber. So here we have the uh, impaction chamber. I can just load it directly in there. And again, I'll secure it using uh, a clamp. Like so. And then I can connect it directly onto the G1. So this just connects using a swage lock connection to the G1. Um, in a real setup, you will also have a vacuum line that will come from here to ensure that you really get uh, the uh, effect of the impaction. Um, but with this setup, we have our nanoparticle generator uh, that uh, deposits nanoparticles directly uh, onto your uh, TM chip or uh, silicon wafer. Um, and in principle, you can use this entire setup um, as is or fairly manually. Um, but we also have our very own uh, uh, control unit so it's a uh, touch sensitive, it's got a touch screen um, and with the control unit you can um, vary the voltage, uh, the current and also the flow um, and importantly it's also able to log your data um, while it's communicating with the G1. Um, there are timer functions on it so you can also uh, decide when it is that you want to change um, or stop gas flows or sparks. So with that um, this uh, concludes the assembly of uh, the G1 and all its accessories, and I would like to return you back to Martin. Thank you, Robert. Um, like Robert already introduced, we have developed this uh, VSB control software, um, which allows us, to, which allows you to have full control over your experiments anywhere and anytime, uh, because it's a hybrid interface, so it can be accessed locally from the controller that uh, Wilbert just showed you, but it can also be accessed from any other web connected device. So whether that's your smartphone, your tablet or your laptop, you can always uh, check in on your experiments and control the setup. Here you can see a small screenshot. Uh, so there's the parameters that can be set uh, the, for the different components of the setup uh, and the data is also shown real life in a graph which can then be stored. This allows for remote control. Uh, autonomous operation and has a really intuitive and easy to use interface, uh, which we believe really adds a lot of value to the setup at, that we provide. And on that note, uh, I would also like to thank you uh, for your attention. I would like to hand off the mic to Andrea Elinka for the closing remarks, and then we go to the questions. Thank you everyone for attending this webinar. We are entering now the questions uh, phase of our webinar. 
So please uh, hold on a minute until we gather them all. Martin and Wilbert will answer your questions directly from the lab, so this should be interesting. Let's wait a minute before we collect them all and then we go live again. Thank you. Thank you everyone for waiting. Our first question is, uh, Martin, Wilbert, ready? How can you control the particle size? Uh, well, thank you. That's a good question. Uh, so we have different parameters that control the particle size, uh, which all relate uh, to the residence time and the concentration in the reactor and the downstream process. Uh, the major influence that we have is controlling the gas flow rate. Uh, the other two that we that have impact on the concentration of the aerosol are both the uh, voltage on the machine and the current. Thank you, Martin. The second question is, uh, if you are making an alloy from two electrodes, A and B, how do you control the stoichiometric ratio? Ah, okay, that's uh, it's going to be a tough one. Um, so, if you would just have um, electrode A and B, I think it's actually quite difficult to control the stoichiometric ratio directly. Um, it is something that uh, you could calibrate. Um, or uh, you can see uh, what the ablation rate is of the individual electrodes um, and uh, get an estimate from there. But there's no direct control of the stoichiometric ratio because the two different metals will have a different ablation rate. Yeah, and to fully control that, you would have to actually use pre alloyed electrodes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have, just a second. Can we also generate alloyed particles? Um, uh, so yes, it's possible to generate alloyed particles. Um, you can either do this by, um, uh, as with the previous question, where you have one G1 and an electrode of, uh, one electrode of element A and one electrode of element B. Um, a second way of doing it is by having two G1s with uh, two sets of electrodes with different um, uh, metals, but the best way to actually get uh, alloyed nanoparticles, um, I think, is if you had electrodes that were already alloys to begin with. Um, this, uh, I mean, really opens up uh, the field, I would say, um, also because you could have one electrode that's an alloy and a second electrode that's an alloy of two different metals. Uh, and in total, you would then have four metals which would form, uh, uh, which could form an alloy. Um, so it is possible, um, and there are very many different ways in which you can do it. Thank you, Wilbert. And I think what is going to be our last question. Any possibilities of making your own target materials, example, specially made alloys? Um, so we provide the option uh, of providing these electrodes as a service, but we also have customers that make their own custom electrodes, uh, either because they are very exotic materials that they would like to work with, um, or they would, do not want to disclose the, uh, the actual application that they are working on. So yes, uh, it's, po it's possible to have them sourced by PS Particle, but we also uh, offer the technical details to create your own electrodes if that's required. Thank you, and I missed an, a one. I want to know the efficiency of the machine compared to the other deposition techniques. Can we answer this? It's a little bit vague. Um, we could give it a go. Um, so if I understand the question correctly, um, what are the different uh, deposition efficiencies of the different accessory units that we have? Um, I think uh, when it comes to the diffusion chamber, uh, because a lot of the uh, nanoparticles pass over the substrate and it's really uh, uh, random um, how the nanoparticles end up on your substrate that has the lowest uh, efficiency uh, around 10 percent 15 percent of your nanoparticles that end up on there yeah it depends a bit on the exact uh, experiment parameters yeah. as well flow rate uh, will also have an impact and uh, which uh, material you're actually using um, the filtration um, has an efficiency, depending on what you're, what you're using as uh, your substrate, it can be around anywhere around 60%. Uh, 
um, because you're really filtering the nanoparticles out of the gas stream. Um, but it can be upwards of that if, you, let's say, your mesh size is really small. Um, and then the impaction, um, all your nanoparticles end up um, on the substrate. So 100%. Um, but the experiment also won't take that long. Thank you. I know uh, we said this would be our last questions, but they keep coming up. So one last question. Yeah. What do you think are the most potential user in terms of research application? I'm sorry, I didn't fully understand the first part that you mentioned. The first question. The first question, I'll do it again, sorry. What do you think are the most, uh, where is I don't really understand the question. What do you think are the most potential user in terms of research application? I think he means what would uh, fit most for which research? Well, first of all, uh, our current portfolio is focused on R&D, whether that's uh, fundamental, applied uh, or industrial. So these are not by any means production tools. Uh, that's some, something that we are working on towards the future. But our current portfolio is, is, is really focused on researchers. Uh, maybe you can explain a little bit more about the different application areas. Um, yeah, I mean, there are a number of application areas that um, you can think of. Um, I think uh, what we've described in the presentation quite well is that um, rapid sample prep for uh, in situ TM or in situ spectroscopy uh, uh, measurements, uh, that's really, uh, I'd say, uh, a nice field to be in, um, but also um, rapid uh, electrocatalyst uh, production, uh, where you can then uh, mix and match different metals uh, on your substrates, uh, vary your substrates uh, uh, quickly. Um, that's somewhere uh, where I also see uh, the apparatus being in. Thank you, Wilbert and Martin. As much as we would like to take more questions, unfortunately, our time is up for today. But we decided to leave the event open for 10 more minutes so you can post your questions then and we will do a follow up email with your answers. Thank you for joining this webinar. We plan on doing more of these digital events. So follow us if you want to be the one to know first. Thank you and have a good day, everyone. See you soon, I hope. Bye.